Right, thank you, Claire and Sam. Um, so today, I, indeed, I'm going to be talking about iconicity and the role that this plays in children's early word learning. Let's start by considering what is iconicity. Um, and I like to demonstrate this by replicating a famous experiment that was introduced by Gerhard Köhler in the 1970s. So you can see there are two shapes on your screen right now, hopefully, um, a green shape and a purple shape. And um, a poll should pop up at some point that will ask you to decide which of these shapes is a booba and which of these shapes is a kiki. So if you could uh, quickly answer um, what you think about these two shapes, that would be fantastic. Um, I will also respond. Just give you a few more seconds to, um, uh, to, to decide um, if it wasn't super quick. Okay, so I'm gonna say that's time up now. Um, if you agreed, oops, sorry, if you thought that the green shape was a, um, a kiki and the purple shape was a booba, then you would be in agreement with 98% of respondents who have participated in this experiment across cultures, across ages. And I can see in the results that 95% of you thought that the purple shape was the booba and the green shape was the kiki. So um, this is a really great example of iconicity because somehow across all the participants in this workshop, um, we were pretty much in agreement that the green shape was a kiki. There's something spiky sounding perhaps about the word kiki and there's something round sounding about the word booba. And this is called sound symbolism. It's the idea that we associate certain kinds of physical properties uh, with certain sounds. Um, and across languages, this is pretty consistent. But we can see this in words in English as well. Um, in words such as tiny and huge, we, may, we might say that the word tiny kind of sounds small and the word huge sounds quite big. So how does this relate to language acquisition? Well, um, Piaget um, suggested that uh, the words and their meanings are what we call arbitrary. That is that if we take um, a, a, a concept or an object such as uh, my cat Edward here who's actually just made an appearance so he may be joining the, uh, the workshop any minute now. Um, my, so if we take this cat here and the word cat we can say that these, these two things are not related. There's nothing particularly cat-like about the, the object cat, right? So if we replace the word cat with the word dog um, we wouldn't necessarily feel like the word dog was any less cat-like than the word cat. Um, it's kind of, um, so basically these two things are, are not connected, they are arbitrary from one another. Which is a bit, better, a bit easier to illustrate when we think about words that are not arbitrary. So this is, in some cases, words and their meanings are not um, separate from one another, or not as much so as Piaget proposed. Um, and a great example of this is onomatopoeia. Um, onomatopoeia represents sounds from the environment. So the word meow represents the sound that a cat makes. So there'd be a real incongruence if we replace the word meow with the word woof woof, because woof woof doesn't re represent the concept of a cat's meowing. So onomatopoeia are not arbitrary, they are iconic. And the word that we've just seen in the previous slide, kiki and booba, also, while they're not real words, they're iconic because they represent the thing that they, they sorry, they sound like the thing that they represent. Um, and indeed, there are lots of different kinds of iconic words. So words such as tiny and huge, glisten, shiver, and the word to represent distaste or disgust, all somehow represent the thing that they are referring to. So onomatopoeia are just one kind of iconic word, and I'm going to be talking about them specifically in my talk today. Because I'm interested in onomatopoeia, because when we look at children's early words, even across languages, we find that iconic words, but specifically onomatopoeia, are present in the earliest words that children learn how to produce. So the data you can see here is taken from a big data repository of children's early words called WordBank. And I've selected five languages, including British and American English. And these are the first 10 words in those languages that uh, children tend to acquire. 
And if we look at uh, the uh, iconic or onomatopoeic words in this data set, we can see that across languages, children are producing onomatopoeia in their very earliest words. So children acquire bar very early on in British English, woof woof and yum yum in American English. And in Swedish, children in, in this data um, acquire 50% of their first 10 words are onomatopoeia. And there's lots of evidence to show that um, on onomatopoeia are indeed very common in children's first words. So just um, in uh, three examples here, um, a study of 12 different languages showed that about 20% of children's first words are onomatopoeic. A study of French showed over a third of infants' early words are onomatopoeic. And then a big study looking at hundreds of children um, across different languages found that about 30% of English words and 41% of Cantonese words are onomatopoeia. So there's, there's clear evidence to show that this is a, a quite perhaps possibly quite an important kind of word in the early vocabulary. And researchers have proposed that onomatopoeia and other iconic words might be easier for children to learn because they help children figure out word meaning links. So when a child's vocabulary is still quite small, it could be very useful to have iconic cues in language that help children connect words with their meanings. Um, um, is linked to my talk today, I discussed the, this in some depth. And what I want to propose is that while iconicity can help children learn words, I think actually there are lots of other features of onomatopoeia other than just the fact that they're not arbitrary that might help children learn them. Um, it's not just that they're easier to map form onto meaning as has been proposed by other researchers, but there's some other things as well that we know about early development that are really important in onomatopoeia. Um, so I'm going to talk about two of those things today, but I propose that there are three reasons why onomatopoeia are important, um, or apart from the, um, the fact that they are connected to the meaning of the word. And that is, first of all, they're very um, relevant to caregiver speech. Um, they're also very important for the way that infants produce words, and they're really useful in interactions. I'm not going to talk about the first one today because I talked about caregiver speech a couple of years ago at, at, the, at the workshop. So you can check out the slides um, from that if you haven't already uh, seen that talk. So <clears throat> let's start by thinking about um, infants' early words and why onomatopoeia might be useful in infant speech. Well, we know that infants' early words are phonologically simple, so they're very easy to articulate, such as dada, mama, ball. And that also, they also tend to include uh, reduplication. That is the repetition of syllables, as in dada, mama, and in, of consonants as well. So baby, bottle, um, yeah, baby, sorry, would be a reduplicated consonant. Um, and then when we think about onomatopoeia, we see that these are also pretty uh, phonologically simple. So ba, moo, quack, quack, often reduplicated, quack, quack, woof, woof. They're also uh, phonetically and phonologically flexible, and I'll talk about that in a second. And I'll also talk about why the prosody can be really meaningful, meaningful in these words. So that is the sound effects that children can use in producing onomatopoeia. So with this in mind, then, it seems that onomatopoeia are perfectly set up for early acquisition. So I, I decided to look into this in, in a bit more depth by looking at some data from um, children interacting with their caregivers. So I looked at 16 children acquiring a range of different languages um, in naturalistic interactions. And I counted the number of times that children produced um, onomatopoeic words, such as woof woof, um, quack quack, and their what I call equivalent conventional words. So dog and duck. So I compared the number of times they produced woof woof with the number of times they produced uh, dog, the number of times they produced quack quack with the number of times they produced uh, duck and so on. We can see uh, the results um, in this graph here. So the number of times the, the children produce the words is shown on the y-axis, the number of tokens. The number of onomatopoeia is shown in orange with the orange circles and conventional words in green. And each circle represents a different child and each child is connected. So their conventional onomatopoeic words are connected with the gray lines. Um, so we can see then that across, uh, not, not consistently, but pretty much across the board, most children are pro uh, pro producing more onomatopoeia than they are conventional words. So it seems that, um, that, the, that when it comes to children's production, they're actually producing these more often in their early speech. 
So now we can zoom in a bit and have a look at how the children produce the words to see if that can give us some clues as to why they might be so common in infants' productions. Um, so I'm going to, um, I've got the phonetic transcriptions here, but I will read them out in case you're not familiar with, um, with reading phonetic transcriptions. But I'm going to start by looking at the, the uh, words related to dog. And I've just picked a couple of examples from the data to demonstrate this. So Lily produces dog or doggy as duddy and woof as uff. Laura produces doggy as goggy and woof as wow wow. And a child known as M produces dog as da and woof woof as bow wow. So here we can see that um, doggy, but none of the children produce doggy in a target like way. So they either reduplicate the syllable or they simplify the word to one syllable. So duddy, goggy or da. But woof woof, we could say is actually pretty accurate across the board. Um, none of the children say woof woof, but they pronounce, they produce it in a way that sounds much like a dog sound. And just to um, kind of relate to how, what I want to say about this is that these words, the onomatopoeia, we're much more flexible in how we interpret an onomatopoeic word as being target-like. Whereas we have one um, strict way in which we should produce the word dog or doggy, onomatopoeia can often be produced in different ways. And we would still say that the child has got it pretty, pretty correct, pretty spot on. And the same goes if we look at the word cat. So M produces cat as ka and Naima, who we'll be meeting later, as ka kaka. And both of them produce meow as mao. So again, cat isn't that accurate for either of the children, but meow sounds kind of like the sound a cat makes, right? Like meow. And finally, if we look at duck, and both children, uh, M and Maria, produce duck as da. And then M produces quack quack as cack and Maria as kaka. So while they're not producing the, although the, um, Maria is actually acquiring English and Estonian, um, but anyway, while, while these children are not producing quack quack, they're simplifying the word, but it still sounds like a duck sound. Now, from these examples, I don't think there's a really strong argument to suggest that onomatopoeia are particularly easy to produce compared with conventional words. If we look just at the actual ad adult targets, but we can see that they're at least equally as producible with their simple articulation requirements and reduplication. But most importantly, we can be flexible with how we interpret um, an onomatopoeic sound. So we can see an onomatopoeic word as being um, understandable even when the child doesn't produce it um, or, or being target-like even when the child doesn't produce it in the kind of um, orthographic form. So I think this gives us a good idea of why children might produce onomatopoeia, but um, we probably get a better idea of this when we observe actually how children produce these words. So I want to show some examples of this now. So this is my favourite um, example of a child producing onomatopoeia. Um, it's a child called Naima, who is one year and one month of age. And in the recording, we can hear the child producing a number of onomatopoeic words, and you can see the transcript um, there as well. What's really interesting here, though, is the way she produces them. So I want you to have a listen to that, if you hopefully can hear it properly, um, and uh, listen to how she's actually producing the onomatopoeia. <laughs> couple of those examples um, very shortly. But I just want to point out here that the phonological forms the child produces are very simple. You can see them in the transcript. They're just simple uh, vowel sounds in most cases and the hoo 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 for a dog and an owl. But the use of extra linguistic effects such as pitch, ch pitch changes allows the child to produce a whole, uh, a wide, much, a much wider variety of words and perhaps allows her mother to understand what she's saying more easily. 
So we can see here that the, the forms are phonologically flexible and also can be modified using prosody. So what this clip also gives us is a really interesting example of an early interaction. So this got me thinking about how onomatopoeia might support children's early interactions with their caregivers. Um, um, interactions are quite tricky to acquire, or they, 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 they could be quite tricky to acquire because they, they require children to um, get the timing of interactions right, the turn-taking um, um, routine. They also need the child to combine social, pragmatic and linguistic competence. So I propose that onomatopoeia might allow children to rehearse interactions across the social, pragmatic and linguistic components when their production capacity is limited. So that's the important point I want to make here, that onomatopoeia can be produced despite limited production capacity. So I want to just show three examples of some early interactions from the data I've been using now, just to highlight different ways in which onomatopoeia can, can be useful in interactions. The first is taken from a child called Lily, age one year and one month. The mother says, is that a bear? waits for the child to respond and she doesn't. So the mother then says, what does a bear say? Then the child responds with a simple vowel, ah, and the child, mother repeats, ah. So early on in her development, um, Lily's production capacity is limited, but we can see how the mother is engaging the child in an interaction by asking questions. The child doesn't respond, but is able to repeat the mother's very simple production of a bear sound, uh, sorry, and that she's able to produce a very simple production of a bear sound, which the mother then consolidates through repetition. The next child is William, age one year, four months. So they're looking at a picture book. The mum says, what's that? Pointing to a dog. The child says, dirty, doggy. The mother says, doggy, what does the doggy say? And the child responds, mm, which is woof or a dog sound. So here we can see the child responds to the mother's questions and engages in turn taking. Um, onomatopoeia then allows them to expand on the topic by saying something about the dog rather than just labeling the dog. And again, we can see a simple uh, production here of the woof, which um, equates to a dog sound. Finally, another example from Lily, um, age one year, four months. What does a doggy say? The child says, uff. The mother says, uff. The child says, uff. And then the mum says, woof. So in this example, we see a combination of turn-taking, repetition, and of course, asking questions. The child is able to respond fully to the mother, and the mother then consolidates this production through repetition. But note that she repeats the child's production of the form first, and then goes on to produce the, the sort of more target-like production. So finally, I want to return to a couple of final examples from the child I showed before, Naima, that I think bring together the reason why onomatopoeia are important in interactions. We'll start with the owl. Yeah. What does an owl say? I know an owl, not a dog. An owl. So hopefully here you can see how important the use of prosody is. So that is the pitch of the sound. Um, the child starts by producing the owl sound at a low pitch, which the mother identifies as a dog. And then she says an owl, not a dog. And then the child adjusts her pitch to produce it in more like an owl-like pitch. Um, so here we can see how actually the use of prosody in onomatopoeia is meaningful. Using a different pitch changes what the child is communicating. So the, the, actually the phonological form is exactly the same. It's just the overlying um, pitch characteristics that make that, that form understandable. What about frog? Frog? Again, another example how the use of pitch sort of contrasted here. It um, differentiates uh, one sound that might re represent one animal to another, which is the frog. She also uses rhythm here to make that very, very simple phonological form um, meaningful. So here we see the importance of iconicity. The sound effects the child is using are iconic. They're inherent to the meaning of the form, so much so that you can't change the sound effects. If you do, you get a different meaning altogether. So we can see how the iconicity of the form can support the child's production of onomatopoeic words, allowing her to draw on prosody as a production resource when her production capacity is otherwise very limited. 
So returning to my final question, well, my first question, does iconicity help children learn words? Yes, I think it does across lots of domains. Um, but what I want to propose is as well as the, the close four meaning links that have been proposed to be important here, they offer lots of really important things for early production. They're articulatorily very accessible. They're useful material for very early interactions. They allow children to practice turn taking. And they also um, offer a positive feedback loop from early production to early interaction, which in turn um, supports children to um, further develop their production skills. So I think the reason there are so many onomatopoeia in infants' early words is because they tick lots of boxes when it comes to early phonological development. So I think that's it from me. Thank you very much.